coffee in back. If you could go ahead and get your cup of coffee and take a seat. If anybody is more comfortable rolling their chairs to the back of the room, please feel free to do that because we are going to be having slides um, on, the, on the screen this evening. Thank you all for coming again to the task force meeting for the Inner Harbor Specific Plan. My name is Laura Stetson. Uh, for those of you who were not at the meeting last month, I am a consultant working with the city of Redwood City. I, I've had some experience working in the city before, and it's nice to come back and, and really focus on an area of Inner Harbor, which is really a, a special place in Redwood City. Our meeting tonight is going to be structured differently than our, our meeting last time when we opened up with comments from the public because we wanted to have the public uh, an opportunity to, to really talk about what the Inner Harbor means to them. And so we, we really got a lot of good comments um, and are glad that the same, a lot of same folks have come back and that they, this time they brought some neighbors with them. So tonight our meeting is going to be about two hours. We're going to have public comment at the end because we think that'll uh, allow you to really comment on what you see presented tonight. If everybody picked up an agenda, we had agendas outside. We have a couple more out up here, which we'll pass out if the folks that we give them. Uh, we've got more task force members here tonight than we did last time. I wanted in particular to, to welcome Gail Robbie and Sean Brooks who um, are part of the task force, and we also have a new member, Rich Ferrari, will be representing the Ferrari property owners, not Mark, so, and Rich actually helped us arrange this room, so serving double duty, thank you, Rich, for that. Is there one other person? Yes, Dave, you are also... Yes, uh, first time. Very good, thank you, and, and I think we've taken care of making sure you have your notebooks and, and everything else, so thanks. We, we're doing a little bit of housekeeping first. Before we get underway on the agenda, I wanted to see if anybody had any concerns with us doing a little bit of rearranging. And that would mean that we wanted to uh, take items two and three and plop them so that we're going to have the task force members, I've talked to them, the, the, the presenters, uh, to see if we could do those before we have Rick Barrett from MIG do the, the presentation on um, on other things. Do, do, do any of the task force members, other than those who I've spoken to already, have any significant concern about reordering the agenda? Um, just general assent. Okay, good. That's fine. And also, I don't think we're going to need a break this evening, unless uh, anybody thinks that we do. I think we can power through it in, in two hours. But again, if you, you have to get up, um, the restrooms are in the hall. Please feel free to get up and, and get a drink if you need to as we go through this. All right, let's go through a little bit of extra housekeeping first. Uh, the task force meeting review summary from the June meeting is not finished yet. We're still doing a little bit of proofreading, so we will be providing that to the task force members and with the summary of this meeting as well in a couple of weeks. Uh, but certainly prior, oh, I forgot the first rule of the meeting is to please shut cell phones off. That everybody's usually pretty good about that. I don't need to say that much anymore. Um, we'll, we'll have those uh, meeting summaries for you prior to the yeah, the July 23rd meeting, so you'll be re reviewing both of those. I wanted to also correct ourselves on two things that I mis misspoke about last time on the meeting, and thank goodness Mike Brown was there to, to help correct us on what ex parte means and, and how it's going to apply to the, the task force. It is critical to your function as a task force member to be out in the community and being the eyes and the ears of the community and bringing back to this group what you've heard. Um, Jill, did you want me to go through the explanation, or did you want to? So I keep going and you'll keep jump going in. And and yeah. So absolutely, if you're out and, and we encourage you to talk to folks, the only uh, and, and to bring that communication back to the task force, the only thing that we will ask you not to do is to talk among yourselves outside of this meeting as task force members. So that it's, that's more of a, a Brown Act consideration is that you can't talk among yourselves. However, you absolutely can talk to the community and to bring those discussions back. And we really encourage you to do that. Yeah. Also, uh, with regard to before, we didn't talk about this last time, but we're expecting that once we get through the summer months, it's going to be a lot easier to make sure that everybody can come to the meeting. I know it's tough during summer vacation time to, to, to have a quorum and, and have a full complement of task force members. But we're, we propose to go by the general rule that a quorum is a majority of the members. So you have a 15 member committee, and so there are eight that is considered to be a quorum. We'll talk more about this uh, at, at our, our formal meeting that's scheduled for the fall months, but we just wanted to throw that out there to, to start thinking about it. That's going to work for us. Also, our 
our next meeting will be on July 23rd from this meeting and July 23rd meeting, the early informational meeting. We're going to get that in the tax uh, in, in the fall. We're going to be doing a lot more materials for review and we're going to be going over some um, operating rules with regard to how do we reach a consensus, how do we uh, go through the decision making process. So we're going to hold that off until the fall because we just want to use these first couple of meetings to, to learn and to listen. Any questions about that? Yes. Uh, uh, one is in our first meeting, there was a notion that we as uh, task force members should disclose conversations we've had relative to Brown Act. It sounds like that's not right. That is we can not just speak to everybody. It's just among ourselves that is the issue. That is absolutely correct. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. Correct. Just to be clear, we are not to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with any other task force members outside of this room about the Inner Harbor area? That is correct. And is that a legal prohibition or a kind of a best or practice? They can talk. It should, they can't. Th thank you, Bill, for mm -hmm. All right, let me jump in. This is Bill Eckern, I'm Bill Eckern, Community Development Director. I'm a, you can talk to one another. You can't reach decisions outside what we, and if there's a more than, more than eight of you, you constitute a meeting. And so it's just, those are just general Brown Act rules and regulations. What we really don't want you to do is if you have a conversation with Dave, and Dave has a conversation with Chris telling him, Dave, this is what Greg's going to do. And, and we create a cocktail party of, 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 of a meeting going around. That's, that's what we want to avoid happening. So have conversations that you need. That's the whole purpose of this. So you can talk to your groups, the people that you represent, also to talk to one another if there's ideas that come out of tonight or any meeting. You know, one-on-ones are fine. It's just don't have meetings and, and don't, don't have them serially so you work your way around the table. Does that, does that, does that work? And if I'm wrong, we'll be back next time. And fix it. <laughs> a lot of you broke your notebooks tonight. They're looking very empty because we haven't given you much to put in. In fact, we've given you nothing to put in there. And so one of the questions we have tonight, and you don't have to answer it tonight, but we want to know if you would prefer printed materials sent to you or electronic materials. And we, we would ask that you send an email to Jill and let Jill know how you would prefer to receive materials. Most of which are going to be in color, and if you're printing yourself, I know that gets very expensive, so you, you might want staff to send your printed materials. It's up to you. Just send your preference to Jill in the next week or two. Speaking of sending emails to Jill, uh, city staff tried very hard to make sure that everybody who had attended last meeting received an email alerting them to this evening's meeting. Some of you failed um, handwriting in third grade. <laughs> and we couldn't read your, your addresses, and so we apologize. If you didn't receive an email, it was only because uh, staff couldn't read the handwriting. If you really want to make sure you're receiving emails, please send an email to Jill Ekus. Jill has cards with her this evening, and she will, if you send an email to her, she will make absolutely sure that she can read it, and, uh, and we'll put you on the list because we want to continue to send email alerts out to everybody. What's her email? Um, Put it on the whiteboard. We will put it on the uh, yeah. Blake, if you could write it up there in the right hand corner, that would be great. I think it's uh, Ika's planning it, but uh, I'll show you Jay's So, what we want to do is go ahead and get into the, the fun part of the discussion tonight. We gave you homework assignments, and three of the brave task force members volunteered to go first and to talk about great waterfront places. What makes a great waterfront place? We ask you to either draw from your experience in the Bay Area, places that you've been in your travels, places that you've seen pictures of, places you've dreamed about, and to put together a five to 10 minute presentation of what makes a great waterfront place, because we want to start to draw inspiration for how it might apply to the Inner Harbor. We have three folks who are talking this evening or making presentations. Carol Wong is gonna go first, Jeff Birdwell, and then, not Melissa Hitcher, but Mike Brown is going to be our third presenter this evening. After they go through their presentation, what I'd like to do is, after Carol does her presentation, we'll have short discussion or questions from the task force members. We'll move on to Jeff, same thing, questions, comments. Mike, same thing. The public, if you can hold all of your comments and ideas to the end, I know that's kind of hard, but we want to reserve um, everything at a, just for the task force members. Then we'll turn to Rick, 
and then Rick will give his presentation, we'll have discussion, um, and then turn it over to public comment. Does that work for everybody? Right, Carol, is she all keyed up? Yep. Okay. Turn it on. Okay. And I'm going to be taking notes, so don't mind me. Okay. Um, um, my name is Carol Wong, and this past spring, I was going to the Tulip Festival in Amsterdam, but I decided because I had heard about the task force and what we were trying to do with the Inner Harbor, I just expanded my tour to take a walking tour of what they call um, a neighborhood in Amsterdam called Eiberg in English, and Eichberg, both in Dutch, it's terrible. So at any rate, one of the reasons why I was interested in it was and why I thought it would be applicable here is it's not 100% applicable, but what was different is that Amsterdam, as you know, has a rich history of thinking outside the box in terms of urban development. They have, from their inception, been behind the walls of Levin. And the difference between what's going on at Eiberg is that this is the first time they've actually gone outside the levees and have gone to cope with sea level rise. And what they um, are doing, and I'm not saying that this is what we want for Inner Harbor, but they are basically building islands, creating housing and commercial space that floats. So, okay, and there, and I put a link on here because assuming you'll have it up there, you can go watch a, um, on YouTube a Discovery Channel video about the making of Iber. But this is me just going out on the tram and taking a look at what is this all about. So here's a Google map of um, Amsterdam, Amsterdam Central Station, and all these black lines are basically rail lines. And Eiberg is actually this whole complex in here, and you'll see that there's a tram that goes all the way down to here. It took me from Center Station to here 15 minutes on a tram, so I could go the complete length. Um, as a close-up of Eiberg, if you remember that tram line, the specific section, this is Google 2008, the specific section was getting off the tram here, looking at, through at some of the water uh, development, and this is the areas that I'll be doing in the walking tour. So the first one is, here's the tram, and one of the things about Amsterdam, as you know from the war, there's a lot of new building going on. If you leave Amsterdam center, all of the modern architecture is very utilitarian, very clean lines. So if that looks like a box to you, it kind of matches the suburbs of Amsterdam. So it's not, oh my God, what are, what are they thinking? Also, in here, along the road, there's a two-lane road. The tram goes down the middle. In here, Skyderland, you can actually see some of the houseboats and floating homes. So imagine all along the transit line, you have these land-based buildings that are kind of the interface to the water-based buildings, and that they have these entryways that you can kind of sneak a peek into um, each of the floating areas. Now, as I'm walking, so I'm trying to describe, so here's the tram line, I go walking down, there's this long street, and then there's another end back there, which is the other, the back part of it. This is what I call first generation. I'm here with no tour guide, just kind of, except for the guidance of the tram driver. What's interesting here is that you'll see the land-based units are on pilings. So they have flow through, water, water flow through. And then you'll see their own floating docks. And back over here, you start to see some of the floating homes. Um, here's another, I'll stand out of the way. Here's another view. And what you see here is the land-based land buildings. Now we're on the other side of the streets over here, land-based building. And you see the depth and the length of how many neighborhoods of floating homes there are. And you'll see this is the edge of the land-based unit, that all of these are floating units. Again, you can see the depth along the, um, so I'm trying to take pictures of what it looks like as you walk along the street. And what blew me away was how many and how intricate a neighborhood it was, so that docks, not docks were, I mean, it's not docks, the piers were the neighborhood streets. Okay, so now you can see farther along, this is the backside view of it. And you see, these are the buildings along the street, these are all the floating homes, and there are other kinds of floating, floating well, vessels. Um, you'll also notice the uniformity, what looks like uniformity of design, mostly in color, color pad, uh, palettes. And now, um, walking along is what I would call the second generation. 
If you notice, it doesn't have the same uniformity. This long building in the back is the land-based um, area. All of this is floating neighborhoods. So I call it second generation because it looked custom, very funky, very cool, and I ran back to tell my husband that I wanted to buy one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still thinking about it. Um, <coughs> Okay, so we're wa I'm walking along just closer. What's really cool about this one, here's a single unit. There's the um, pier. This is their outdoor backyard. It's on, a, it's on a float. And then they got their other toy. Okay. So what's really interesting is everybody's unique architecture was also based on how much slip space they had. Okay, so I'm just going to scroll through more interesting things. Okay, now you'll see common design elements. So you see the width of the hull being very common, but otherwise looking pretty different. On this one, this is the close-up of house that I would like. <laughs> also, I passed an architectural firm that was in one of these off floating office buildings. So I thought, Boy, they're having a heyday. They're just like crank them out in all these interesting designs. Okay, let's see. Sorry, I went backwards by mistake. There's another one in which you see kind of a backyard front yard concept of stairs on the front. And I thought, well, gee, in Redwood City and, and in Redwood Shores, we have stair fronts in front of townhomes. Look at this. There's like stair front in front of floating homes. Um, also, another outdoor backyard, and you can see the way they use the floating space versus the, um, the house footprint itself. Um, this is now walking along the street that has all the back-end land-based buildings, so I'm now farthest away from the tram. There's a long promenade. Up here, there's uh, parking for bikes and cars, and if you know anything about Amsterdam, there's many bikes and people, more bikes and people than cars. And there are three lanes, one for trams, one for cars, one for bicyclists, and pedestrians just, we kind of fit in in between. It. So, so one of the cool things is the bikes outnumber the cars. So that's why you don't see a lot of vehicles here. It's because they have bikes. Um, okay, so now this is just walking along. And here is one of their sidewalks. You can notice all the signs of bicycles. Blue one. Very cool. Um, now, <laughs> you can see the imagination that's going on, even though the footprint is roughly the same, and the variety of uses of materials from naturals to metals and metals upon metal. Um, okay, I'm just going to keep going pages. Now, here's another view. This is like what I call Pier 2. It's the set. There are three piers in the new um, area. And what struck me on this one was, You'd say, okay, these are all equal boxes. No, they weren't. Each one of them was very unique. Okay, okay, famous blue house. I was fascinated with that one. Um, okay, um, about this one, this is more of a utilitarian view in which you can see every, every single home had a basement. So this is the free board. So this is basically a basement in the concrete hall. And then um, what you can see here are the loops to anchor them to the pilings. And my assumption was also, if you notice, there were no utilities anywhere. I didn't see a light. I didn't, all I saw were light posts. And, and there were no telephone lines, no obvious sense of um, uh, infrastructure, like sewer pipes, water pipes, nothing. Uh, this one was obviously getting service because there was work. Their windows were open and they were something's coming out this window right here. So it actually puts a new twist on how to maintain your house. Um, again, the infrastructure, looking at the, um, so in this case, I was looking at adaptive to sea level rise, because I was imagining that one could just raise the piers, and then it just, so it just slides up the top. Again, another long view. And in this case, I think this is a good example of a variety of materials. So you see what looks like concrete on the near side, then going to natural woods, then going to natural bleached woods, and so forth. So people were having fun designing their own homes. You could, you could see that. So this is kind of like what you would see if you lived there. 
again, more bikes that, you know, absolutely no cars, obviously. This one's really interesting. That is actually some kind of um, exotic hardwood made into slab. So it created texture, but also went with the, um, the uh, um, exotic hardwoods. And you can see the, at the bottom these little windows opening up the shutters. And this is the front side of it. Totally, absolutely stunning. This family, they went with the high tuck polished look, they had rounded corners on their house. Never mind rounded porthole, but rounded corners on the house. Um, I think the one on the left here looks a little closer to what we've seen in Docktown, but then you have in contrast the blue one on the right, you see all the open space at the top. Again, an outdoor backyard, solar panels on the top. This one disguises the side stairs with um, slats integral to the architecture. Um, this one was people who live in glass houses, I guess was the only thing I could call it in that one. Um, this one was interesting, outdoor space. This was behind, so if you imagine their slip was along the house, it was behind it. So you can imagine in the summertime there would be canvas topping and so forth. Lots of outdoor seating. This house again, the blue one. Note inside, this is why I love this one so much. Spiral staircase coming down. It was just absolutely stunning. I'm guessing it was a, a, way more than a million, but. Okay, now, let me go back one picture. Back here. These are all the land-based units behind the piers. And if you notice, there's like, oh, more utilitarian. But what's different is that each one of these fronts is a townhome. And so that they were very much into um, all of the floating homes had very much an open, living, airy, light space. So I think they were used to living in public. Uh, but it was, and then you could see the levels as they go up. And I happened to go by one of the, pro and I was saying, well, how much is this? This was about 440,000 euros. So that's the sale price I saw on one of them. Not that I was in the market. Okay, so here you can see all the doors in a row. So those are all front doors. Now this is, again, the intersection is called basically Brigantine Lane, if I could say it in Dutch. So you can see on the left the land base then the promenade, and then the floating homes. You see a few cars there. Now this is the back side of those same, same land-based units. So all along there, if you notice, um, if you also you've been in, around the area, they don't have a lot of trees. So if you say, oh my god, that's dead and buried, they just don't have a lot of trees. And this would be, th this is their basically their backyard for the townhomes um, that we saw on the front side. Okay, there is the price tag, 339,000 euro on sale till May 1st. And then this is just an, an example of what's next door. So if you go out beyond um, the last row of land-based units and you look off to the west, that's a bridge that you'll see. So you can see this very modern, clean line architecture. And so lastly, um, my takeaways from this was, um, one, we can be bold. We don't have to do the expected. We don't have to do the, you know, slam the townhomes right up to the water, et cetera. We can basically, I think we have some freedom to use some imagination here and be bold in the same way that Amsterdam was bold about going, going outside of its limits. Um, secondly, I was, a, I was just completely enthralled with the, as you can tell, the innovative design of the waterfront community, and it had public access all the way to the water. So there was nothing private. The only thing that was private was their floating backyard. Um, maybe if they put more curtains in, they'd have more privacy with respect to me. Um, also, they, if you look at any of the history of Ivory, they basically created a leading edge industry in terms of architecture, design, and um, construction, building, building these units. And I should say, it's not just residential. I would walk by and I saw businesses 
inside these same structures, not in the floating home part, but along the land base with flow through water underneath. Um, it also had public and people powered transit connections between the city and then the suburbs. And I was asking somebody, well, he lives in um, you know, Iberg and what did he like? He said, I love it. I can, 10 minutes, I can be home and it can be very quiet and I can hear the birds, I can hear the water. Um, and if anybody's been to Amsterdam, it is restaurant heaven, as far as I can tell. Just absolutely a great city to walk around in and do stuff. Also, architectural design is distinctive yet cohesive. Those neighborhoods look like they belong together, but they, they were all also each and individually in the second generation homes. Very unique. Um, the yeah. homeowners yeah. have a lot of latitude to be able to see you feel up a lot of work within their same work. And that they had neighbors that were um, neighborhoods with land and water-based streets. And I put streets in quotes. Um, and then they have floating backyards and outdoor spaces. And um, um, lastly, they, they had, had an outdoor architecture. They, they had, had floating land and structures. They had floating homes and commercial businesses. Um, and they had peer systems that can adapt to sea level rise. So I'm not suggesting that this would be the entire of what was project area that we're talking about. I'm suggesting that where we have the interface from land to water, and we're looking at a housing element and even a commercial element as well, that there are ways to design it and that the, architect the architectural and engineering skills are out there to be able to make use of this, this water land interface. Did I go into 10 minutes? Thing. I'm looking solely at the interface yeah. of water. 